Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of VCTV. I'm your host, Kyle Elikana, and we are here to speak about cybersecurity, a very important topic that seems to be brushed aside uh, in many cases when it comes to the development of applications or protocols or networks, whatever it may be. Security and privacy seems to be the last thing sought, the security layer or the data layer, as we've also referred to it here as well on VCTV. But we've brought together some of the best and the brightest from around the world to share their thoughts and insights and on the ground perspective about this particular topic. So you as investors know what's going on, where you should and shouldn't be paying attention to, and entrepreneurs, what you need to know about building your next applications and who's investing in those as well. Um, and if you'd like to be on a show like today to share your similar thoughts and insights, or you're an entrepreneur that would like to share your company product or service in this area among others, do reach out to the team and or myself and we'd love to find the right spot for you. And speaking of that team, a big thank you to the LA Token team and to Maria for making VCTV possible every single day. And if you're wondering where you can get more VCTV, right up here. One of these directions, VCTV, we've got it, uh, latoken.com slash VCTV, we are there for you. And with that, let's go ahead and introduce each of our guests today as we're going to be speaking about cybersecurity. First and foremost, Raghu, an expert in this space, my friend. Welcome back. It's a pleasure to see you. A little intro and a little background. Thank you, Kyle and uh, VCTV. I'm uh, Raghu Rao from Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, we have a, a consulting company called Harvesting Enterprises that helps uh, companies with uh, planning to exit uh, all stages, uh, seed to harvest, as we say. And uh, uh, cybersecurity is an uh, area that I particularly am interested in, uh, in all different stages of the cybersecurity stack, uh, to, uh, from data protection to cloud security, to OT security, to network security, to whatever you have. And uh, unfortunately, as we all know, in addition to the health pandemic that's going on, there's also a cyber pandemic that just started, uh, which apparently started at the same time in March, mm -hmm. and, uh, but people did not even know it was happening. Uh, and uh, so it uh, it's, seems to be pretty uh, pervasive in that uh, it's across government agencies, across a lot of private companies, and they've figured out a way to kind of stop it. But what happened and where, what other things are buried in and where it's going is something that will be discovered in time. So Well, very big TBD, and we also had a lot of news over the past seven days, and more importantly, the past four days, uh, and maybe even in some cases, more importantly, the last 24 hours of some major security issues uh, that we've started to see. And this idea of us working from home more has also prompted more of that as well. So, Raghu, I want to hold that. We're going to come back to it in just a moment. Uh, next up, I want to welcome Sam. Sam, it's a pleasure to see you again. A little intro and a little background for everybody. Thanks, Kyle. Good to be here. Uh, Sam Yomaz, general partner of Block Solidate EC. Uh, we are a Seattle-based venture fund uh, investing in enterprise applications of blockchain um, and data access management, authenticity of documentation, business processes, uh, verification of credentials uh, are an interesting area for us, one of our focus areas of investment. So happy to be here. Wonderful. Uh, well, welcome, Sam. And again, congratulations on uh, the latest funding news as well to you, Kate, and the entire Block Accelerate team. Uh, and last but not least, Gary, welcome back to the show. Mr. Grandmaster, Wizard of Artificial Intelligence, my friend. It's such a pleasure. <laughs> the wizard thing again. Okay. It's great to be here. Actually, Kyle, I'm actually just this second, I'm communicating with the former C Chief Security Officer of Apple, Rick Orloff and eBay. And I was trying to get him to jump on the show. He's in the middle of something, or he said he would, but he's one of the top guys in the world on cybersecurity and a very, very good friend of mine. So uh, yeah, my name is Gary Fowler, a serial entrepreneur. I've done uh, two unicorns, our original management team at Click Software, um, and also Eva.ai, as well as uh, 16 uh, other companies that uh, I've co-founded or participated in since I've been 21. So I just love starting companies and um, it's great to be here on VCTV. I believe that, you know, cybersecurity, I just wrote an article on Friday and I was actually involved in some cybersecurity stuff yesterday, uh, helping out. It's, uh, it is something that we need to talk a lot more about. It's like uh, aging in place, right? 
uh, we don't talk about it till it's too late. So we had better take a serious uh, look and understand with all the changes taking place with quantum computing. And of course, AI is, um, you know, is, uh, I, I just wrote the article on it on Friday, so I can get into details about it. But yeah, it's a great time. Well, and quantum brings a whole curveball, and I we're going to come to that. And I, I I know the reference curveball is also uh, tough to mention with quantum because that actually is something that is a quantum reference as well. So it it well, provides at least you didn't issues. Say a two bid ball or something like that, right? right. Uh, or a ripple. <laughs> I mean, it's a ripple. You know, I, yeah, we, we we've talked about that, but to your to all of your points, I mean, this has been a very interesting experience over the last year of how cybersecurity has really come to light in ways that it should have always been, but because we live our lives more digitally than ever, it's now becoming something of our top topics. And over the last, uh, as I mentioned, few days or hours, we saw multiple protocols on the blockchain space along with apps that were taken for um, a couple million to tens of millions of dollars uh, in, in terms of hacks. We saw a ledger uh, and that infam infamous uh, hack that just got out and a lot of data that was released, unfortunately. We also saw um, the US government. We saw a number of corporations globally and, and on and on and on and on. Uh, this has just been in the past week and we're, we're, we're just about to come upon the holiday season uh, as well. And as I said, we're working more from home. This is becoming more of an issue. Raghu, I wanna start off with you. I mean, what is the current state? Where are we? What are we doing? What are we thinking about when it comes to cybersecurity right now? Or are we not? Uh, we aren't thinking enough, as uh, Gary was saying. Uh, see, just to kind of give you a perspective, uh, to go back to our uh, medical analogy, right? We have, in addition to preventive, preventive stuff as well as uh, reactive stuff, right? Preventive is to prevent an infection from happening. Reactive is once an infection happens, how you treat it, right? That's called therapeutic. Uh, but no, for healthy people, the holy grail is to prevent the infection happening, even if you're exposed, right? That kind of thinking hasn't yet come to cybersecurity. Uh, it's all, all about preventive and reactive stuff. Uh, preventive stuff is great, but there is a lot of things that compromise it. The most important thing is insider threats, which is what happened in this uh, specific case, the solar wind uh, sunburst thing. Apparently, just, they just had one, one individual compromised. And, uh, and uh, I mean, they're very good after that. You know, it became like a Trojan horse that was is actually a cybersecurity monitoring tool that was used to compromise all these systems, which is kind of sad, you know? Uh, yeah. So, which means like the risk management frameworks weren't working because the risk management frameworks are supposed to catch these kind of things. So what I wanted to talk about is the whole blue ocean area, which is the, like a vaccine for cybersecurity. Uh, I, I'm I, you know, invested in a company called Splitbyte, which is specifically doing that. And what they do is take the data, uh, essentially randomize it and bury it into, the, into multiple places, whether it's on the cloud or off the cloud, so you cannot go to one place or two places or three places and get at the data. Even if there is a system breach, it does not translate into a data breach. We call that safe harbor protection. I think that is an area that has to be explored as well as uh, obviously AI and uh, you know, AI is very important in terms of being able to look at the patterns and see if, you know, if there is any accesses that are happening that are unusual and things like that. So, so I think it is an area where there is a lot of investment, but not enough compared to a lot of other areas, given how important it is. Uh, you know, it's kind of like the, the vaccine area was for a long, long time. It didn't get enough investment, but now that it's a become an existential issue, the similar kind of thing is where we are in the cybersecurity space. And, and thank you, Raghu. Gary, uh, to you to add on to that. I mean, Raghu is calling out artificial intelligence here what are you seeing in terms of the state of security and cybersecurity at that and, and how AI may be playing an impactful role? So, you know, the, the, um, we got to look at it differently. So I wrote an article actually with Rick Orloff, who is a former CSO at Apple, a couple of years ago. And we talk about plugging the holes before they're a problem. So identifying where those particular risks are through you, the use of artificial intelligence and making sure that they're 
taken care of before there are problems. So basically risk prevention. And so what do we look at today? Where is the challenge? The challenge is we need to each have our own little uh, force field around us. And by that, I mean, imagine a hyper-personalized artificial intelligence assistant, security assistant that understands your behavior and the kind of things that you do, your daily activities, you know, and your behavior, your tendencies, and it understands it to such a degree that it could directly understands when there's any type of changes or deviations from the norm and formulate a response, right? Maybe it comes up and says, hey, you might wanna take a look at this. Are you sure you wanna do this? This could be a problem. That's really when this starts getting interesting because today we're on that journey. We started down that road, but we're not quite there yet. So that's the first part of it. The other part of it is, you're right, this is always a chicken and the egg situation because as soon as technology is developed that can thwart the, uh, the bad guys or bad ladies, what happens is there's a technology that comes up to be able to surpass it. So always a chicken and egg situation. So, but we have to directly understand if it understands our patterns of behavior, it understands the machine learning algorithm, uh, understands when the normal business operations are, understands um, what the workflow generally looks like, it can start to make some decisions and send up warnings. And that's all it's about. But in the world of unsupervised AI, it starts automatically plugging the holes. So what I'm encouraged about is that, you know, we, on one side of it, humanity's taken, you know, I, don't, I was gonna say a quantum leap forward, but <laughs> taken <laughs> leaps forward and, um, and, and not a ripple but it's taken leaps forward. And at the same time, we have so many sensors coming up with the internet of things in our house, our refrigerator. You know, I can imagine a world when, you know, the, the system, a Morpheus type system says, hey, the roof is leaking. You know, I'm serious, the roof is leaking. I'm gonna call up a, a carpenter to come over and fix it. Let me see who's the best and the cheapest. I'll review all the reviews and I'll call automatically. So we're not that far away actually from it. So, but then it opens up a whole um, abundance of opportunities for not good nefarious people to come in because why? We've got so many different things that we need to have covered that we need to have systems to be able to do it. So it's not like um, at this point in time, using machine learning and deep learning, using artificial intelligence is not an option anymore. It has to happen. It's we're mm -hmm we've got too much data around us, too many sensors out there, too many things, that, even our cars, right? Imagine, mm -hmm. you know, you're driving down the car and, and then, I mean, think about what happened last week with the attacks on the US government. And now imagine if they decided to go after Tesla and shut mm -hmm. all the cars down uh, or speed them up so you couldn't mm -hmm. stop them. So we could have all kinds of deleterious situations take place we got to look at the system today. And then, of course, quantum computer has a whole different level of complexity and ways that we can help protect ourselves and or the bad guys use it and nothing good happens. And I want to come back to quantum here in just a moment, but that's a, that's a great point to lead on. And thank you. And Sam, I want to come to you. Same question. I mean, current state of security and cybersecurity at that from both your viewpoint and also what you're looking at on the, the blockchain and the enterprise side as well. Sure. So like uh, Gary and, and Raghu were mentioning, uh, there's definitely an increase in concern and more reasons to be concerned um, as IoT devices are proliferating and um, work is being mostly done remotely and authentication and verification also ends up having to be done um, remotely as well. Um, in, there are some interesting areas that um, think are maybe lower hanging fruits uh, for blockchain to, to mm -hmm. come in. Um, first, in a macroscopic sense, the decentralization of um, data storage, or even if it's just a permission ledger of who can access what, or a encrypted and um, hash documents that are stored on a decentralized ledger that can later be used for verification purposes, 
uh, macroscopically, the decentralization element uh, is a key feature that, uh, sorry, this is not working too well, um, that uh, can help the cyber threats and mitigation. The chicken and egg problem or the uh, burglar, burglary, uh, burglars and the thief tech, uh, technology co-evolving with the, the police and alarms technology is uh, the common pattern. We'll, we should expect that. And um, the highest value targets should be the ones that are adopting the, uh, the best of breed uh, cybersecurity uh, modalities. And uh, in particular, some interesting examples that are you know, blockchain powered um, come to mind in the case of verification of security audits. Say you're a bank uh, and you have a tech vendor and before you're able to recruit them for a particular project or service, there's an onslaught of uh, verifications uh, that you have to do. And there are cybersecurity audit companies that um, have to issue certain licenses before large enterprises can begin purchasing from them. Mm -hmm. And um, at times, what tests are done under what conditions or when they were last done um, are not easily audited, uh, nor are they fast to do. So in the process of onboarding, um, you have to rely on uh, tests that may have been done way, uh, a few months ago. So um, the blockchain powering aspect of it is these audits and what audits are done can be uh, traced. And also the credentials that are issued for the tech vendors so that they can be cross used across different um, entities could, could also be a, an additional leverage point. And then once you have multiple financial institutions of multiple customers sharing in on when the last audit was and what were the tests that were done, then those tests can be um, updated on a recurring basis, enabling all clients to see what the latest uh, verifications and audits were. So I think that's another really interesting use case. We're uh, looking at a few use cases uh, yeah, derivative of that and interesting companies. Interesting. And, and Raghu, uh, I mean, what are you seeing coming next in this space? I mean, looking ahead at 2021, what gets real and, and what, uh, you know, what are we still waiting for when it comes to security? Yes, uh, the, I think the, the security, cybersecurity area, it's, it's, it's a wake up call right now, right? Everybody thought, you know, uh, the other pandemic is going on. This one is I mean, in spite of uh, everything moving to remote access, uh, there's a buzzword called zero trust security. Unfortunately, it's mostly mostly buzz. And uh, we really have to make it work that way. And for that, there's a lot more investment and a lot more. See, there is, we have a lot of best practices available, standards framework, uh, risk management frameworks on by, by multiple areas for uh, you know, in, uh, IT security, for OT security, we have from NIST, from Nuclear uh, you know, Regulatory Commission, there's all kinds of critical uh, you know, uh, standards, critical informa information protection. But what happens is that there's human error as well as insider threats, which you know, we cannot eliminate that easily because it's like a leak, right? From the inside, once whatever processes you have, if there is an insider leak, then you know, it's, it doesn't matter. So we have to have the systems and risk management frameworks that are able to get beyond the insider threat. The other threat that is looming, which is going to happen very soon, is the whole quantum hacking, right? Uh, because the uh, encryption, the old encryption techniques are now, some of them are already being, you know, uh, hacked by you know, uh, quantum computers. So that is another area. The third area is Encryption is kind of, it's good, but it, there is a lot of issues with key management. So even if, uh, again, there are, there are some single points of failure. Uh, so I think we need good standards compliance to existing frameworks, which are actually pretty deep. One of the companies that I'm advising, it's called Squirrel Compliancy. They do deep uh, scans of networks. And what they're finding is that a lot of these agencies and companies have actually compliance you know, programs in place, 
but the level of scanning they do is like one or two levels deep where you could go like five or six levels deep and uh, and part of this is there's a lot of bureaucracy i think what uh, sam was talking about there are all these risk assessment companies and uh, but they you know it's kind of like saying we'll do an assessment every quarter i mean a quarter in <laughs> this thing is like quantum time right you need to do it every day uh, i mean you need tools that not even day it, can, it needs to be automatically be running looking monitoring stuff and uh, those kind of tools are available it's just that uh, i think things are, are moved slowly so far we need to get to a different kind of just in time and um, just in time may not be the you know popular word right now given uh, the supply chain issues we had but we need something that is continuous monitoring it's not something that happens in periodic time you know it has to be continuously monitored and uh, and thank you ragu and, and with that gary quantum i mean what are you seeing happening in 2021 but how does quantum just throw all of this off well that's exactly what's going to happen <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, when you have a system that's 100 million times faster than a conventional computer and you tie artificial intelligence into it, you've got something that, I mean, the unlimited uh, possibilities. So what is going to happen? We're going to have, from my perspective, we'll see progress. It's going to be uh, step-by-step progress. So we'll see more progress in quantum, you know, IBM, uh, Microsoft, Google, all have quantum and a host of others all over the world. So it's not like they haven't already started the journey. The, di- the challenge is they're highly unstable. So, you know, I liken it to erosion. You can't really stop erosion. What you can do is um, reduce it. And so it's exciting, it's exciting times. Imagine uh, being able to do a problem that would take 10,000 years and tw- tw- 200 seconds. So that's the kind of power we're talking about. In terms of quantum, I mean, once the quantum computer come online, I view that each country will have a quantum computer that'll be offensive and defensive. And so it'll be a whole different kind of war. And you can see it happening now, right? Look what's happening with, um, you know, nefarious forces from all over the world, you know, starting to probe and look at, you know, infrastructure stuff. Well, I mean, we got to be concerned. What about the grid? I was joking about uh, electric cars, but it's true, right? <laughs> well, I we mean, saw this. I mean, just a quick second. We saw this with Jeep, right? We saw this with Jeep and a few friends that tried this out and just, you know, had a little fun. Not the best type of fun, in my opinion, but nonetheless did this. Um, and it was very simple for them. This yeah, is a well, real thing that know, can happen. Well, imagine. And it's really, really serious. So we've right. now... Being all connected, everything tied together as one has given us great opportunities to advance humanity and gave great opportunities to be able to destroy what we have. So we got to be really careful. And in terms of quantum, I mean, we're going to have defenders. I mean, I joke around like the defenders of the universe, but literally the quantum computer is going to be a first line and it's happening now. And the more probes and the more actions are taken by governments in a, you know, these cyber attacks, the faster we're going to start to develop these quantum and the more money is going to get poured into it because mm-hmm. we need it. And not saying they don't have it now, Kyle. Who knows what they have right now, right? Right. Well, so, there's only a handful of, of powerful enough quantum computers that you've told us before, but that doesn't mean that this isn't going to be at scale. And, and sorry, Sam, I, I saw you on mute. So go, go ahead and yeah, no worries. comment. I just wanted to ask a follow-up question to Gary because I value his opinion. Um, the erosion analogy wanted to make sure I understand that was that uh, in regards to the development of the technology? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, in terms of the uh, stability of the systems, right, they're highly unstable, you can't like, totally uh, get rid of it. But what you can do is reduce it. And I liken that to erosion. I mean, it's really hard to get rid of if you've ever uh, built houses, right, it's really hard. Uh, to stop the erosion, what you can do is you can reduce it a lot. And so I liken it to that. And that's the challenge we have today because they're, they're highly fragile. Of course, um, you know, the good news is we'll, we'll figure it out. It's just not going to be so easy because it's a extremely complex. But it's, I mean, we're already on that journey now. It's not like the first steps haven't been taken. It's just we have a lot of some time, whether it's five mm-hmm. years or 10 years. And 
but it's going to happen and it's going to change everything. I mean, I just did a panel on drug discovery in Europe with the top pharmaceutical companies, you know, and, and these are the ones that some of them developed the COVID vaccine. And it's really interesting that, that you know, they're looking at quantum computers, they're looking at, at uh, AI uh, for drug discovery and they've used it. I mean, if you look at Pfizer, Pfizer used IBM Watson then developing the coronavirus vaccine. So it's not like it hasn't already happened, but it's gonna permeate a lot of different areas. And as it's going down through, you know, I worked on a paper with my, I took off a summer and I took MBA students to uh, Silicon Valley. And we worked with some of the professors at Stanford and our project was living to 120. Well, with this kind of, if you look on Forbes, I wrote an article in genetics and uh, genomes and AI. But I mean, it's like all of it's going to be impacted. It's like, this is not separate. Everything is together, right? The same AI uh, can be used in all kinds of different ways, transportable AI models. It's just a matter of the training set. So what I look at as I look at this future, it's a very bright future. Quantum's coming in. It's going to help us, I mean, everywhere, right? Healthcare, med tech supply chains everywhere. It's going to be like time sharing too, because people aren't going to be able to afford a quantum computer. So you're going to have to buy time on it to be able to use it. It's going to be interesting how that dynamic shifts our lives. And then in terms of cybersecurity, I mean, we either defend, right? And we get into these technologies or it's going to be like a nuclear weapon. One country is going to have it and the other doesn't and nothing good's going to happen. Right. And, and Sam, uh, thank you, Gary. Sam, looking towards 2021, I mean, what are you seeing in terms of cy cybersecurity really playing a role or not? Um, or is it, again, in, in Gary's case with quantum, kind of throwing a wrench in all of this? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure how quantum computers will be a protective measure um, against quantum attacks. I see that more as like the nuclear weapon analogy, unless you build a whole system with quantum computing, then it's not quantum computing attack proof. Uh, so I'm not putting two and two together on how their defensive Sam, abilities. Sam, it's not going to be attack proof. It's going to be attack resistant. There's a difference. Right. Hmm. Right. Right. Um, so I'm not sure how quantum will be used in, you know, making things attack resistant uh, yet. I have some thoughts about it. Um, I'm looking to see how the market will form the, the solutions and understand the challenges. And mm -hmm. uh, more generally about cybersecurity, um, the greater utilization of IoT devices, I think will most heavily influence the need for uh, cybersecurity. Um, the GDPR compliance uh, is another wind in the sails of most cybersecurity companies or, or developments. Mm -hmm. um, giving access uh, or data sovereignty to users of many applications is another wind in the sails. So I think um, those will very heavily impact the market value, market opportunity for cybersecurity projects. Mm -hmm. What about in, in just in blockchain in general? I'm, I'm going to throw this uh, to you since you're our expert on this this area on the panel today. I mean, we've seen a number of decentralized finance or other applications, decentralized applications that over the past week have seen a number of slips in their protocols. Um, and millions of dollars are lost. I mean, is this something that we're going to see continuing? And is there potential improvements that we're looking towards in 2021 to help this um, maybe not happen as often uh, mm -hmm. as it does in other applications? Yeah, I suspect with uh, new applications, this will continue to happen. And um, different hacks and holes will be found and uh, leveraged uh, and abused um, in the earlier iterations or earlier cycles of applications. Mm. And um, is it inevitable? Probably that, that there's some amount of hacks that will happen and sort of in an organics perspective, 
it might be best to think of this as uh, an application uh, mm -hmm. standing at the, its own test of time and uh, sorting out its kinks. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, it's no, no matter what security audit company you recruit, it's very hard to say it will never be hacked. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think the market sophistication will grow around what kind of audits it will expect out of decentralized applications. Um, but uh, making it completely hack proof is probably an ideal and a good goal to aspire to, but probably not going to be achievable. Right. TBD. And, and with that, I would love to come to each of you on, on your big closing thoughts. Um, I know Raghu has got a lot more to share. So your big closing thoughts as to what's going to happen in the next few years here around cybersecurity, what people need to know if they're looking to make investments in this space, because it's a, it's a space that should see a lot more investment and actually sees much more than people realize. Um, but hopefully we'll start to see the application. So Raghu, uh, I want to start off with you. I mean, your big, bold predictions, but also um, closing thoughts as to the future of cybersecurity as you know it. Yes. Cybersecurity is like a substratum technology, right? On which everything else uh, that is, uh, you know, requires uh, cyber com communication, storage, all the stuff, uh, the security is very critical. And uh, AI, just like enabling tools like AI and blockchain, those are enabling tools, but everything needs security. Mm -hmm. And the, how you incorporate that into different, for instance, if you take blockchain, one of the critical aspects is the authentication. It's all great that everything is distributed, but who gets to call the shots is done through authentication. If you compromise that, like in crypto wallets and things like that, right? Then mm -hmm. all the other stuff doesn't matter because you know the trust is very important ultimately, right? In all these mm -hmm. systems. So the trust is built on how, how good the cybersecurity is. And right now the thinking is prevention and reaction. We need to get to proactively, it's kind of like if you put your stuff in a bank locker, right? Uh, you know that, uh, you know, you take your key and then the bank uh, banker brings his key and without that, nobody can get to it. That kind of, uh, you know, uh, security trust has to come in. And that, that it, the technologies are there, but like I said, most are reactive and, you know, or like preventive. Preventive is good, especially AI, I think can help a lot in terms of finding the holes. But the problem with any technology thing is that there will be new things coming, right? Uh, new vulnerabilities mm -hmm. and new uh, technologies like quantum computing, which can break encryption and things like that. So you need a little bit of outside of the box thinking, which is where something like distribution, blockchain has the same thing, but more from the validation or of the data verification. Here we are talking about using the similar distributed concept, but for cybersecurity. And I think that has not come yet. And I think that's where, uh, you know, some companies are starting out. And, uh, and I think uh, a lot of this uh, is right now compliance is another area where a lot of companies are technically compliant. They run things and all that. And it's kind of like saying we are recycling, but we don't know that whatever we put out is really going to be recycled or it goes into the landfill. It's a similar kind of thing. They're checking boxes, but we don't know like whether they're really, you know, applying the spirit of it as opposed to just kind of, you know, uh, you know, checking boxes, which is happening. So there's a lot of compliance technology available and AI can play a big role there. And uh, so that's where I think, you know, things are going to change in the coming year. Wonderful. Thank you, Raghu. And where can everyone find you online to continue the conversation? I'm available at LinkedIn, uh, Raghu S. Rao. And, uh, happy to help in any way. So. Wonderful, thank you. And Gary, to you, uh, closing thoughts on the industry of cybersecurity, and then of course, where can everyone find you as well? Yeah, so this is a great time. I mean, with the uh, amount of data, the amount of data that we have on the planet increasing at about 62% mm -hmm. per year, we've got a lot of, to protect. And you know, it's a lot different than it was uh, 30 years ago because now we've got infrastructural issues and we've got widespread, um, you know, people have uh, IOT sensors throughout their homes. I mean, it's, it's, it's a different situation. Now we got cars. Uh, so we got a lot of 
a lot to protect. Focus on cybersecurity. It's a great opportunity. Student, uh, students out there, make sure you study uh, AI at your university. Come out, focus on cybersecurity because it's a great opportunity for you. Look at quantum computing. And uh, I think it's a great time. Use your, your uh, as we've talked about earlier, get your visibility out there, get on social media, get listed as a um, influencer and uh, get that visibility up because that's also critically important. You can reach me, Gary Fowler, uh, on LinkedIn, on Twitter. You can email me, Gary at GSDVS. We look for incredible companies from around the world that want to go global. And we use Silicon Valley support. So I'd love to hear from you. Give me a call, uh, email me, whatever you want to do. Um, I'm on WhatsApp. I'd love to talk to you. Thanks, Kyle. Wonderful. Thank you, Gary. And Sam, close us out. Any closing thoughts? And where can you be found online as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, cybersecurity, like any security, is effectively chance events. But uh, you want to make that up chance of being hacked one out of a million, not less. So um, even getting a lock on your or door is, you know, effectively a chance that somebody else's key won't be working. Um, and in that way, um, there are many technologies worth building to in increases our chances of being safe and secure. So, um, so I applaud anyone who is pursuing this domain, um, and I encourage them to apply uh, and and seek out. And, funding from us. I can be reached at info at rocksorate.vc and uh, on LinkedIn uh, with my name, Sam Yilmaz or the extension BitAngel. I'm also on Twitter at Materia Not. And i um, happy to connect. Thank you. Wonder wonderful. Sam, Gary, Raghu, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and insights around today's topic of cybersecurity, something very important we all need to take very seriously and also make sure is included in our company products or services as we build them and release them to the market or continue to add them if they are not for already have been thought about uh, in those products already. But with that being said, again, thank you all for sharing your thoughts and insights. To your audience, thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you heard, click subscribe, give us a thumbs up. Do reach out as well. Thank you, Raghu. Reach out if you'd like to be on a show like today, like Gary, Sam, or Raghu to share your thoughts and insights. Thank you, Sam. Around cybersecurity or a number of other topics, industries, or regions around the world. Thank you, Gary. We'd love to have you here on the show and entrepreneurs. What better way to end the year than start the next and joining us on the virtual stage here at VCTV to share your company product or service, to get real-time feedback, build foundational relationships, and exposure to the entire VCTV community. With that being said, reach out to the team and or myself. We'd love to find the right spot for you. And speaking of team, a big thank you to the LA Token team and to Maria for making VCTV possible every single day. With that, I'm your host, Kyle Ellicott. You can find me everywhere online at Kyle Ellicott and all of our guests. Make sure you add context when you do reach out as to where you heard us, what you want to talk about, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. With that, we'll be back here tomorrow with more VCTV.